Crom, I never prayed to you before. I have no tongue for it. No one, not even you, will remember if we were good men or bad. We fought or why we died. All that matters is that two stand against many. That's what's important. Valor pleases you. Crom, so grant me one request. Grant me revenge. And if you do not listen, then to hell with you. I'm Chris Bivey. And I'm Eddie Webb. And today we're going to talk about Conan the Adventurer on John Ross. Welcome back in time with us today, folks, on Genreless. Um, It has been a, a, a weird trip to get here. The TARDIS wouldn't take us here. Sherlock <laughs> couldn't deduce a way for us to find our way here. And anime couldn't blow a hole in the galaxy to get us here. But we still managed to make it to the Hyborian Age. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, I have such a complicated relationship with, with Conan, honestly. Oh. Well, I mean... It, it, it is, and, and honestly, this extends to, to, to fantasy uh, to some level, is that uh, uh, it feels like something I should like. And I have tried many, many times to read the original fiction. Um, uh, but uh, Robert E. Howard was a writer with, let's say, certain proclivities that have not aged well. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um we're going to jump right into it. Before we do that, <laughs> I want to start the episode off by apologizing. I am sick again. I think I was sick what, six months ago. So it's like a biannual thing now. And <sighs> if you hear random coughing or gagging, it's just me passing out on the floor dying. And if I keep talking, that means that uh, I managed to come back to life much like a Highlander. I, I, I thought you were going to say, like, if, if you're passing on the floor dying, it's because of the show, but, you know. <sighs> no, no, Eddie. This is, like, top tier what we're going to talk about here in a second. That, if I that am is now true, curious. the tier is very low. <laughs> <laughs> well, start at the bottom so you can only really go up. <laughs> and I don't even know if that's true, but we'll you find out. You say that, but I know it's in the future. <laughs> All right, Eddie, you, you started off by talking, you know what, even before that, uh, one of the reasons that we decided to do a fantasy run mm-hmm. is because we realized that we had not done one at all. It's something that popped up a while back. We looked at doing a historical run, but then we're like, well, technically Sherlock is a historical piece, depending on how you look at it. And we wanted to do something vastly different as a palate cleanser and for this palate cleanser, it's like we decided we saw a big tankard of grog and just started downing them all as we go through the tavern. And then we lick the floor to try to clear <laughs> our mouths from the palate cleanser before we pass out. Um, and so we're going to do an entire run of fantasy. I think it's 13, maybe less. I think it's less. I don't know if we could stomach 13. Um, How's that? We, didn't, we didn't agree to 13. What, what were we talking about? Here? I may have tipped my hand early. I think it's eight. <laughs> <laughs> ish um and then we'll do something totally different so if fantasy is not your thing feel free to still download us so we get that one download and did not listen <laughs> uh but, but i know when you introduced this run last time you you simply framed it as sword and sorcery so maybe we could talk a little bit about what that means so people know going in what kind of shows we're going to be talking about okay the general overview was the idea of sword and sorcery. And I think that kind of holds true for the start, but then it changes kind of towards the end of the run. Cause mm-hmm. a lot of sword and sorcery focused more on uh, the hero, not big, huge global battles, but like personal conflicts in, in a morally gray area. The mm-hmm. morally gray area stays for most of the shows we're going to talk about, not all of them. And that's one of the reasons why it is vastly different, say, than Lord of the Rings, which is like a world ending epic. You know who the good guys are. You know who the bad guys are. And you know who you're. And magic has a very distinctive role that it plays in those. It's more of a a high fantasy for some of the Tolkien stuff that then slowly receded to be lower fantasy. While Sword and Sorcery, magic is there, but it's still almost an unknown element that is dealt with. And frequently, it's an evil that has magic while the good doesn't. And I use good very loosely because Conan's not a good character. Conan's like an evil son of a bitch. 
that's moving their story along. He's just our protagonist. Right. Um, and, and, uh, a lot of times it gets lumped in with, with pulp fantasy and there's a pretty strong overlap in those two. But I mean, from a, from a pulp perspective, it's also lots of exciting adventures, which are very violent. Um, uh, and depending on what time frame you're looking at, possibly, uh, women have a very specific role in that, which is not great. Um, uh, but generally speaking, it is, you're right. Um, it, it's, morally gray characters who are trying to fight against overpowerful odds and generally against tyranny of some form to their own betterment like they're right. not doing it just for the good of the people they're doing it because they're getting something out of it right it, and, and, they get to take over maybe a kingdom maybe they get a bunch of money for it right and, and, and to compare to your point like lord of the rings is much more uh what we call epic fantasy which is generally people who are um um either generally good or at least ultimately going for an altruistic cause who are fighting and usually have a pretty have a stronger grasp over magic on in some capacity and while you're thinking well frodo and bilbo don't have magic true but they have gandalf who is one of basically a, a mini god running around with them with a whole bunch of power and they also have a, a very powerful magical artifact in their possession but it's the artifact itself lends more sort of to the Conan S style because it's a great, powerful, corrupting magic item that they don't really know how to use. Whenever they use it, it only fucks them up. Right, which is which gets into uh, uh, the problem with fantasy is that uh, it's not exclusive to fantasy, but certainly it is. I think more prevalent is that a lot of these subgenres of fantasy are incredibly muddy. Um, uh, uh, you can look at a lot of these things and go, well, actually, this probably fits more here than there. Um, and so as you go through this run, you're going to see stuff like, why did you choose that? And so it's like it's going purely by our own eclectic viewpoint of what we consider to be a, a, a sword and sorcery slash, you know, uh, um, gr grimdark slash uh, uh, gray fantasy. There's all various terms. Uh, pulp fantasy um it could be it could be any of those things so it, it, it's really hard to think to it's, it's vibes really is what we're talking about it, it's it, you know this is this fits it's here because hands. i think it fits here yeah it, it, it's, it's all hands. punk subgenres uh, of like no it's not oi retro punk it's you know skinhead retro punk and it's like uh fucking cares as, <laughs> as you can tell eddie has been writing cyberpunk lately <laughs> in case you could grab gasp grasp that we both have but it, eddie's more i think in the vibe now than i am because I, I turned in mine and i moved quickly back to haunted west because i'm trying to write a freaking scenario that instead of writing i'm podcasting with eddie go figure that's how, that's what writers do well to be to be fair um i i've always been well not active uh, um <clears throat> tangential to a lot of, of punk subcultures a lot of my life um and, and that was kind of honestly punk was kind of my first foray into understanding how both how genres work and how they're ultimately meaningless um uh because the the, the joke for a long time is if you get uh, three punks in a room um you'll end up with a fight in two new bands they're of different genres um <laughs> because that that's just how sub 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 subdivided it can get in in the weeds of it um uh, because by the nature of that entire culture everyone needs to be an individual and so they need to carve out a little space that's uniquely theirs um and, and that frankly translates a lot to literary um i think that's i mentioned because um, oh, while you were punk i was goth so it's it's an interesting divide well, in similarities between the two goth goth is <laughs> Whether goth came before punk and punk came before goth is a bit of a debate, um, uh, but certainly there is – gothic punk is a thing, and goths are somewhere in the punk tree, right? So so a lot of what I said for punk absolutely applies to goth because, I mean, there, there's sub, 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 I, sub. I would sub say that, that punks branched off from the goth tree, but each to their own, you know. Right, exactly. You can argue the, the, the which came first. <laughs> um, I, I, I have – no desire to relitigate that because I'm firmly of the opinion that punk lasted for about six months in the seventies. And that's pretty much it. <laughs> <laughs> and everything else after that is just derivative nonsense. Uh, uh, I say that lovingly, obviously. Um, but uh, I mean, fantasy in particular is weird because it's something that what we now consider fantasy 
ultimately started in the 1920s, but fantasy existed before that. So basically, a lot of the trappings we get of fantasy came from the 20s on. Um, and then things got a bit muddy for a while, and then certain things kind of just locked into place. But fantasy as a concept existed way before that, uh, and so uh, some people bring some of those older elements back in, and they're still technically fantasy because they're part of this older tradition. Uh, uh, some people, you know, follow from very specific sub branches, like is it the Tolkien branch, is it the Howard Eden branch, whatever. Um, and then you have stuff like okay. Then we have, you know, now we have urban fantasy and romance, you know, urban romance fantasy and, and all sorts of other things that it, it becomes extremely confusing. Um, so I think part that's of, one of the reasons why another I, part I of it watching, is oh, go ahead. Well, another part of it is for you transition on is that it's been retroactively relabeled certain things like sword yes. and sorcery came out. It was labeled, I want to say, by was it Lieber to Moorcock yes. in the 60s? to go back and describe what Howard did in the thirties. And so you have people decades later redefining what genre your work is, and they made Howard the father of sword and sorcery genre. Right. Right. When at so the time, it's hard it to just... have it fall in delineated lines. If someone else decades after you comes back and say, this is what your work primarily is. So it can yeah. describe their work. And, and from Howard's letters, he thought he was writing historical fantasy, although it's, it's, very loose definition of the word historical. Um, he was just like, I'm just kind of making up my own history and then writing historical fantasy. He didn't really have word for that. Um, but he still felt like he was writing something that kind of sort of maybe existed in our world. It wasn't really a whole completely different world. Uh, um, but you're right. Uh, it was the fans started seeing these trends and going, oh, I want to put a label to that, much like we have in comic books, you know, the Golden Age, Silver Age, Bronze Age, um, but what where those ages begin and end are just completely arbitrary and often up to the individual deciding them. Um, so uh, yeah, it's all retroactive bollocks. And uh, I mean, Lord of the Rings was basically because Tolkien wanted to write an Icelandic saga, but just use his own characters. <laughs> and the publishing company may decided how many books it was going to be. <laughs> so right. Stuff like that that determines why we have what we have. So it's fascinating to see the history of it and how it was created versus what the original for these authors wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And to get to video I'm curious, interpretations. Though. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, no go ahead because I'm going to transition to Howard in a minute. So please go ahead. Okay. I, I was just getting, well, I was just, uh, before we talk about Howard pretty much, um, in terms of, of video interpretations of it, um, uh, a lot of it was because uh, fantasy movies became really big in the 80s in America. Um, uh, I I want to say Conan was the start of that, but I'm not 100% sure. I do think that Dragon Slayer, I think, that came out before Conan was ahead of its time. <laughs> right, right. I, I think it was a case of like – there were fantasy movies before them, but I think it was – Conan was kind of the big, oh, this can make money. And so much like Star Wars in the 70s, let's make a bunch of knockoffs. Um, and so you have Hawk the Slayer and Beastmaster and Krull and all sorts of these. Uh, and then a television comes around that's like, well, maybe we can make that, but on a lesser budget. Um, and so they're trying to make syndicated television on a, on a relatively cheap budget um, for to mixed success. I'm actually double checking something now because I'm really curious. No, I was right. Dragon Slayer was 81. Conan the Barbarian is 82. Okay. And Dragon Slayer, I don't think was a super successful movie. I think it was decent, but I don't think it was like successful. And Conan was successful, right? Uh, and and but both of them are pretty firmly in what we would now call sword and sorcery, right? And that's where a lot of those '80s fantasy things get. So like, it really wasn't until the 21st century where epic fantasy or high fantasy, whatever you want to call it with Lord of the Rings movies became also a viable success. And, and so a lot of the television after what? that was relevant to that, Eddie, to that. Are you looking over the 2000, I think that was before Lord of the Rings, I can't remember, 2000 D and D movie with Marlon Wayans as a thief. No, and there was no D and D movie. And, I'm sorry, there was Tom a D and D movie. As an elf. D &D, the D and D movie we reviewed from 2023 did exist. You're correct. <laughs> 
And Tom Baker did not play an elf. Tom Baker played Tom Baker wearing elf ears. So Tom Baker played an elf. <laughs> Tom Baker is a fake creature in himself. I will agree with that. <laughs> well, God, that's not at all a compliment. That could be like anything. I, is he like a red cap? Is he a she? Is he a so? Wow, I'm about to go into a changeling discussion with you now and <laughs> in the game, but we're gonna we're not here to talk about changeling as much fun as that would be. We're here to talk about why you don't like Howard because you made oh, a comment at the start. Right. I had forgotten, and I'm bringing it back. Right. Um. So, long story short, um, um, Robert E. Howard. We got nothing uh, but time, and this show is not good. Oh, did I tip my hand? Um. <laughs> um. Uh, so he was a contemporary to H.P. Uh, Lovecraft. They they shared correspondence quite frequently uh, to a point where he was one of the first people that Howard's – sorry, that uh, Lovecraft allowed him to use elements of his mythos in his work. Um, uh, but while he was not as explicitly racist as Lovecraft, he certainly was racist. And that definitely shapes a lot of his stories, a lot of his storytelling. And while Conan maybe is the least impacted by it, uh, that is not saying mm. much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, let's let's go ahead and put this up because I think we forgot to do it because I was making a joke. Uh, we're covering fantasy, and fantasy is going to have a lot of sexism, a uh, good chunk of racism. Right. A whole bunch of other isms that we may try to touch on per Ableism. show. Oh, yeah. Definitely Ableism. Yeah. Uh, that we may try to touch on per show. I'm not sure how extensive we're going to get into it because this is the first episode of a new season. And this show is just bad. But it's it's a cheesy kind of bad. But there's bad stuff to it. And it's not... I wouldn't even say intentional. Uh, I'll, I'll have to think about that one. But for the genre itself... Fantasy has a lot of those isms associated with it. Right. And if that's not something you want to engage with or hear us possibly go into a, a deep discussion about, depending on which show we're watching, because I think I can think of one coming up in the future. Um, and, and Eddie's face is like, mm. and one of the reasons why we're not going to skip some of these, I think, is because we're comfortable now enough to have these discussions that we may not have been comfortable us to have in the first or second season. Yeah, right. Um, I, I will say that, um, this show is very nineties, um, which means, uh, uh, it has the things that are sort of acceptable for nineties syndicated television. So we're very firmly in the, uh, Mortal Kombat conquest territory of, of how things are presented. Um, I think it accidentally removes some of the more problematic elements of the literary Conan, but it's probably just because of standards and practices at the time and not because of any alpha real intent. Uh, but, you know, I'll, I'll take the wins where I can get them. <sighs> and regardless of the stick that we're probably going to give this show shortly, for a 90s TV show, it felt badly inclusive, but it was inclusive. Yes, yes. Badly inclusive is a good example of the way of phrasing it. But I will also then say go look at other 90s TV shows and includes what they are. Go look at Hercules. Go look at – well, Xena was a little bit better, but that's because – other stuff, but look at all those shows in comparison to this and look at the leads of those shows. Right. Right. It is, it is by the standards of the day inclusive and accidentally has aged well in some areas. Um, but I acting is not one of them. <laughs> that is definitely not one of them. Oh my God. Um, but uh, honestly, the three episodes I watched, the whole time I was like, oh, they're, are they going to do the thing? Like, oh, they didn't do the thing. Okay. All right. So, I mean, that's said again, damn me with faint praise here. Uh, but the praise is there. Eddie <laughs> only watched three episodes of this nonsense. I watched six since we're starting at episode six. So I can give some additional context. But I'm not there yet. I want to go back to Howard. Eddie has said a little bit about Howard. But one of the things that we do if we talk about a show who the creator is a part of it, we give a little bit about Howard himself. Howard was born in like around 19, 1905-ish, I think. In Texas. And yeah. what's that? Uh, he, he lived in Texas. Yeah. I uh, grew up in Texas. Uh, I want to say his father was like a, a local doctor who sort of traveled around. His mother was 
God, like an intellectual of some kind. I, I think, don't remember what her day job was, but she sort of installed a love of history and everything else into Howard growing up. And Howard had a harder life, which also sort of impacted how he views society, how like strength is what you need to get by mm -hmm. to make your way in the world. Uh, he started studying a lot of history and everything else. And he actually wrote, uh, started writing at a really young age, like super young and getting yeah. published. Like, and that's when he's like a teenager. Him. Yeah. Kind of like Michael Moorcock. If people go and look, Moorcock started as like a six year old, not quite six, but you know, he was there. Um, right. And Howard was prolific and he wrote a whole bunch of different genres. And there's a love of Texas that is sort of infused in his work with some of the historical points. And Eddie's already talked about the correspondence with Lovecraft. I want to touch on the fact that his mother was a huge part of his life. Cause I think the father left and when his mother was sick and he didn't think she was gonna get better, Howard went out and unfortunately committed suicide. So he died mm -hmm. at a young age of 30. So all the work that you see here that's been done has impacted society is by someone that was, that wrote for maybe 15 years. Yeah. Which is unfucking phenomenal regardless of like what isms and everything else I'll say about Conan and crawl. And he, Howard actually wrote like comedies and yep. everything else. He's Howard is literally genreless from all the stuff that he's done. So there's a bunch of praise to be had for the work that he did. If not the context that it represents. No, absolutely. Um, uh, uh, there is a really fantastic collection of 10 volumes, which basically, reprints all of his pulp work because it's all fallen into public domain um in chronological order of as as they were as best as they can determine the way they were submitted um so you could see his evolution as a writer uh and like he did uh, uh poetry he did pirate adventures he did spy stories um he created not only conan but he created solomon kane he created uh uh, like I said, a uh, 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 call, a uh, crawl, the, the Irish hero. Um, uh, he did all sorts of things, and honestly, he wrote I mean, comedies, it, Eddie. Yeah, he yeah, wrote he wrote, comedies. It's... Yeah, he wrote, he wrote, he wrote um, other stuff. And one of the reasons why I have such a complicated relationship with him is that his genuine, his prose is really good. Right. I mean, we talk about watchable. He, his, his prose is very readable. It, it clips along, but it has great turns of phrase. It's extremely evocative. Uh, and you see that extremely early in his career. Um, he has a fantastic grasp of the language. It's just sometimes very frustrating when he puts that grasp towards. Mm -hmm. And if people really want to know what about Howard, when you look at Red Sonia, I want you to go back and look up Red Sonia and see who Red Sonia really was before the comic artists are the ones that changed Red Sonia into what we view Red Sonia as now. It wasn't Howard that did that. Right. Yeah, the the, the, bikini, the you know, bikini thing was absolutely a comic invention. And that's not to say that Howard didn't use uh, that because one of the things is he was writing for a pulp magazine and pulp magazines would usually have scantily cut women on the cover and they would sell more. And that is part became part of the entire thing that he also incorporated more heavily on because it made money. And I'm <laughs> not going to say it wasn't already there, but it definitely uh, amplified that. There were certainly plenty of times where pulp writers would be told, hey, here's the art we bought. Write a story around this. Which I think that'd be a fascinating show itself if we went to like a deep dive into the pulp history of pulp. Sure. Yeah. At some point. Um, there's a lot of them are freely available online now. Yeah. If anyone wants to, to hear that, uh, let us know. Right. Uh, the other thing that's interesting about Conan uh, from a literary perspective and how it's shaped kind of its various interpretations is that uh, uh, he was one of the earliest writers outside of Sherlock Holmes to actually try to create a canon and specifically he wrote his stories out of chronological order. Uh, so the Conan stories, if you read them in publication order, it's nowhere near his chronological order. And much like the Sherlock Holmes can, there's some debate about which order some of the stories come in. But there was a very clear effort by Howard to try to keep a, a continuity so that the stories would at least 
feel like they belong in a certain place in Conan's life. Um, but that did mean that ultimately there's quite a few different versions of Conan that you can possibly pull from. Um, and so uh, uh, this show is pulling from the most popular um, Conan as a wandering adventurer part of his life. Um, although it is slightly later in that than we see in the movies, I want to say. Because movies is when he's just left Samaria, if I remember correctly. And this, well, this is this, pretty firmly this, after that. The show does not adhere to like the movie timeline or the comics timeline. Uh, it, it makes sort of its own variant of those. They don't explicitly say it, but if you've seen the movie and you know this, for instance, I don't think the... Uh, enslaved Conan origin at the, in the credits. We'll get. We'll actually start the show in a second. Uh, is part of it. That's not Conan's story. Right. Um. The one thing I did want to touch on. I want to go all the way back to sword and sorcery. One of the qualifications I made for the season was that we're going to try to do a run of shows that were not Earth or were so far in the past. It really isn't Earth. Right. Which is why we start with Conan in the Hyborian Age. It supposedly happened slightly after, like, the sinking of Atlantis. And five to ten thousand years before um, any real history of the rest of the world happens. So, effectively, this is Earth, quotation marks, but it's not Earth. Right. It, it, and that's it is, kind of the trend for this season. Yeah, it is so divorced from our history that it might as well be a, a, a world. It you In fact... It's more problematic if you think about it as being Earth history because then all the tropes and, and uh, assumptions, stereotypes become more offensive. But if you think of it as a, just a fantasy world, it actually helps a little bit. Um, so, And one of the things I read about Howard decades ago is the reason he chose to do it in the High Boring Age is because it was too research and problematic to have to do the research and the history to make it accurate. And he is fucking correct. Yep. <laughs> as a historical writer... Fucking A, yes. I should have written the Hyborian Age and called it a goddamn day. Yep. All right. That's my writer rant for the morning. Also. <laughs> I'd have about 40 fucking books by now if I did that. Um, <clears throat> I'm done. Uh, anything else about post-history of the show before we get into it? Um, yeah, I, I think I think that covers everything. Uh, do you know anything about the creation of the show itself? Uh, I know that it was shot in Mexico. Really? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, that's about it. I, I, I also know that Ralph Mulfer, Muller, whoever the lead is of the show, was good friends with Arnold Schwarzenegger. He was yeah. also he's also been in a slew of bit parts in movies and TV series. He's in Gladiator, for instance, um, and all over the place. And one of the reasons, though, he's been in things, he really frequently doesn't have a speaking role. Right. Because part of it is his grasp of English for some of the stuff he's in is not as good as Arnold's was at the time when Arnold did Conan. And if anyone remembers Arnold's accent in Conan, uh, take that for what you will. Right. So, so, so the lead is also Austrian, right? I think he's German. German. Okay. And they were uh, weightlifters together. Right. Uh, that doesn't surprise me at all. <clears throat> yeah. Well, I think it's essential because in this incarnation of Conan, Sometimes Conan has clothes in the books and everything else you read. Not this one. It's like you need to wear a loincloth and boots. That's it. We ain't giving you shit else to wear. How do you feel about that? Okay. Right. If you're lucky, we may give you a helmet with horns, which also was absolutely a creation of the comics. <laughs> All right. Anything else before I actually go into the show? We've we teased people enough about the greatness that is. Conan the Adventurer, not Conan the Sumerian, not Conan the Barbarian, not Conan the Pirate, not Conan, Conan King, uh, King, Conan King. of Thieves. I can keep going. Yeah. Actually, I've always had a soft spot for Conan's Thief face, but yeah, no, let's talk about the show. All right. um, so I mentioned before I watched more episodes of Eddie because I'm starting episode six. I want to watch the first episode, which is actually a pilot episode. So it's two episodes. Of course just to see if there's any relevant points that's not covered. And all you need to know is no, there's not. The opening credit tells you everything. The only thing you're missing is, which you've even put together when you watch later episodes, is King Hazul has seen a prophecy that a great warrior with a sword from Atlantis is going to come and kill him from his talking skull. The so, first episode. 
Sorry, go ahead. Wait, so, uh, let's say so. So Conan's sword comes from Atlantis. Yes, which you, that's what you find out in the second episode, part two of the thrilling two-part pilot. First episode, just Conan hanging in the woods. Uh, he gets tricked out of his dinner by uh, this woman, Shock, and then he goes back to their village. Conan and the woman fall in love. She gets kidnapped <laughs> by the evil King Hazul, and Conan goes on a journey to save her. That's where he meets Otley and Zibin. And at the time, there was a different character who was like Garvin or someone else. And the three of them, Conan, Zibin, and Garland, were gladiators in the pit that Conan freed them from. So, of course, they would follow Conan because he freed them. Right. And he finds a sword of Atlantis through a really bad version of the elephant story from the Conan novels. It's nothing like that story, but that's what they made it. Mm -hmm. And then the four of them join forces to help Conan take take out the king because the, one of the king's servants kills Conan's true love in the second episode of the pilot. So Conan is a free agent to date and bang every single person he encounters that he wants to. Mm -hmm. Because I forgot her name, her entire line, all the entire thing is Conan. I would have borne you good sons. Ugh, dead. <sighs> oh boy. And the person they got rid of like Garvin or whoever was all right. So we talked about how they have bad representation in the show, but it's representation. And Garvin was a very large man. Mm -hmm. And so there, there was jokes between Otley and him, Otley about his size, Garvin about his size. And he was gone by the fourth episode, Eddie. <laughs> and they replaced him with Bayou. Bayou. Oh, I can't tell you how much that name bothers me. Um, Bayou. <laughs> <laughs> who is a person they met on the road who then just joins their cause. I didn't even finish the full episode. Episode four, he's replaced. I was like, got it. That's what I needed to know. And they <laughs> write off Garvin with like one line. Otley says, uh, he got a lot of money and moved back to his home village with a woman. End. That's it. No other explanation for his disappearance. Wow. That is some uh, uh, writing out the third Doctor Companion level bullshit. <laughs> It's almost like the actor came on set that day and goes, this is a shitty ass show. I'm fucking up out of here for a better career. Right. And I want to mention all that simply because if you look at the opening credits, every time Bayou pops up, it has Andrew Craig as Bayou's name. That is incorrect. The actor's name is like TJ Storm who replaced him. Andrew Craig is the original guy from the show. Look, Eddie's looking at the internet right now. It's like, Chris has got to be wait, fucking wait, wrong. No, no, I know Chris T is wrong. If, if, if it's who I think it is, TJ Storm, yes. Uh, TJ Storm, I'm pretty so, sure, was in Mortal Kombat. No, that was not what I'm thinking of. Oh, why do I know that name? So I want to let you know that 22 episodes, for 18 of those, they have the wrong credits for the actor that's there. And it's the person of color who has the wrong credits associated with their name. Right. Uh, yeah, and the TJ Storm, that's why I know the name, is because um, he's since done a lot of uh, video game uh, voice work, um, but also actually knows a whole bunch of martial arts. Uh, yes. Uh, he was in uh, Avatar. That's what I'm thinking of, too, the live-action Avatar. I'm unsure if, if we said this on-air or off-air, but Eddie pointed out this feels very much like a, a Mortal Kombat that we watch with Matthew. Yes, yes. It has a lot of those vibes, but worse acting. Somehow, yes. <laughs> I am going to compliment one person's acting when we get there, but that's going to be it. Right. Um, also, uh, uh, since we're in this stage right now, I'll save it for later, but I'll do it now. Um, this show has a weird propensity <clears throat> for super close zooms. So, like, randomly your conversations, the muscles. first in space will fill the entire fucking screen. <laughs> You've got to see rippling muscles, Eddie. No, honestly, if, if, if it was a case of, like, seeing, like, their chest and their face, I would be fine. No, it's, like, just their head and nothing else constantly. And it's just like, I don't need to see this person's pores. And this is before HD television. I can only imagine what it looks like <laughs> in HD. Wow. So I'm going to be honest. I've never seen this show beforehand. I didn't even know this show existed. Because I did heavy research to find fantasy things. Because I think everyone knows fantasy is not my usual genre. 
I may have read some books early on, but this is never my genre. So I had to find shows that lined up with my idea. And then I had to Google best episodes of the show because I wasn't going to sit there and watch 22 episodes and figure out the best one. I think mm. all of our listeners are great, but I don't have that kind of time or torture of myself. <laughs> right. And so these were the some of the highest rating ones that I chose to show us. And they are shows that exist. Okay. I'm going to start this in a, Oh, ooh, there's one more thing I have to do. Eddie, you, you've played some fantasy games. I have. What is a class of Conan, Zabin, Otley, and Bayou? What are their classes? And uh, why? Well, Conan's obviously a, a fighter. Um, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. Even though in, we talked about some library version, he has different roles, but most pop culture version of Conan, he's, he's a fighter. Um, Bayou is pretty clearly a thief. Both in temperament and in skill set. Um, Zeban is a guy, <laughs> uh, and Otley's a bard. I'm thinking. I, I'm pretty close with you. I was gonna I was gonna stick with Conan being a barbarian, and I was actually gonna make Bayou a fighter rogue. See, I, I'm actually – hilariously, I'm actually not on board with Conan being a barbarian because rage very rarely comes into this interpretation of Conan. Mm. I don't know. See, I don't think the actor could portray rage, but I saw moments where there could have been rage. I see. So you're you're going by the intent rather than the application. Yes, because we've commented on the acting of the show, and I can't, can't right. hold anything by that. Okay, fair. Um, and yeah, and honestly, I think all of them, if we're talking about multi-classes, then yeah, I think all of them probably have a bit of fighter mixed in. Yeah. Wow, though. I was just curious. All right. Let's let's do this. I can't waste any more of our time. We're almost like 40 minutes. I'm still yet to actually <laughs> talk about these episodes. Right. Okay. Season one, episode six, The Ruby Fruit Forest. <laughs> just off the bat. Wow. Then we get a little party banter, uh, knife play between Bayou and Otley before Conan proves it is his show by throwing away the ruby they're arguing about. <laughs> and we ride, dire- and we ride directly into a trap. Conan fails to save Otley from the river, but has some bonding time with the waves and the rocks. The trio pick up Otley's trail shortly afterwards, just like Strider from how they did that scene. Uh, walking around a soldier's campsite, it's been picks up the trail, and the trio continues onward. Ambushed! Then a thrilling combat scene. Ching, 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 ching. In a forest. Swordplay, acrobatics, and a fucking flail. They use a fucking flail. Who uses a goddamn flail in a TV show? Uh, no Conan idea. the Interrogator discovers after the battle that King His Zul sent General Nor on a mission into the forest. And I'm stopping because there is a thrilling combat. Eddie, how did you like this opening? So, first of all, I don't think you know how the word thrilling means, because you keep <laughs> using it, and I don't think you're using it the way it's supposed to be used. <laughs> um, uh, but, so, I- I'll be honest, like, the first time I was watching the show, I was like, oh, look, there's a character who's mute, and there's a character played by a little person, and this is going to go badly for both of these characters. And, spoiler for the rest of the episodes we're going to watch, it weirdly doesn't. No? Um, uh, Otley is frankly, Otley's one of my favorite characters in the show um, because he just does not take anyone's shit. And it sounds like this is not true in the previous episodes, but from these episodes I watched, his size is not a point of fun. And when it, people walk up to that line, he is quick to cut them down. And so I like that. It was a point of fun and banter for the pilot episodes. That is frustrating. <laughs> But that's so they could get their gag at the end of the pilot between like him and the big guy. So then Otley can say, and I don't let people talk about my fucking size, motherfucker, mm. is what it kind of comes down to. And the thing for the pilot is no one else understood Zabin except for, I think Garvin, I don't remember his exact name, because the two of them had been in the arena for years together. So he understood sign language and he was going to teach it to everyone else. Which I liked. I, I liked the fact that um, sign language was 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 normalized, um, and uh, so writing for a silent protagonist is hard. Um, 
examples of this is watching people talking around uh, uh, R2D2 or um, around uh, um, Groot in the Marvel movies. Uh, so you have to have characters on some way kind of reiterating what was said. And there's a lot of that, and it's clumsy. It's always clumsy when it's done. Um, but there are a few times in this initial scene where uh, Zabin gets does something with the sign language, and everyone kind of laughs and they go, "Yeah, that's true," and they move on. And it's just like we don't get to, we don't get to hear the joke, and I actually kind of like that. <sighs> so die like I said that we're gonna give a lot of stick, and it's badly done, but it is done. And the fact that it's like you said, totally normalized. He's in the reason that I do enjoy the show as much as I do is because. It's competency porn for most of them. Yep. Like they're all exceptional at the two or three things they do. Right. And that's a lot to be said for. Um, and, and I don't know what Codan's good at though, but well, there's yeah. that. And, and also, uh, by virtue of the fact that is not speaking part, <laughs> Zeven ends up being the best actor in this whole show. <laughs> <laughs> oh god. Okay, I don't know if it happens here, but it's going to happen soon. It happens cons consistently. And I need to go ahead and point out now that I am frustrated and irritated by the f they keep inserting panther sounds around Bayou when Bayou is fighting. I don't know if it happens yeah. here, but it's going to yeah. happen. And it's constant. Like, he's yeah. an animal. Yeah. At first so, I thought it was Conan getting those, and then I realized later that was not the case, and that was frustrating. <laughs> No, your your black guy named Bayou making animal sounds is not there. Nah, nah, right. Nah. Um, also, I get that it's the thief archetype, but Bayou being the cowardly one also bothered me. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's... So we gave Which it some fair, praise, and then we said it's badly done. But, but again, like, in, in this weird kind of up and down thing we're doing here... If we're going by traditional stereotypes, Otley should have been the cowardly one. And he wasn't. He's actually extremely brave. In the first episode or two, Otley has that role. And I think when they shifted out the other character for this, they switched that role to Bayou and they made Otley now a lot more confident and is like a badass. I get Pip vibes from the original series of yeah. Ultron whenever I see Otley. It's like, you go, Otley, stab that motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I I completely agree with you. Like it uh, sounds like increasingly as I've I've uh, we've been talking about this, like it is accidental. Um, and, and uh, they traded one set of isms for another, <laughs> but you know, they could they could have they could have kept the one set and added more. So I guess they're at least they're keeping their 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 carbon neutral isms as it were. <laughs> they're not adding to it. The all right. What is your problem with this thrilling combat that we've seen, Eddie? It is it is the first of many I, thrilling I can hear, combat to I witness. I can hear the quotes around it when you say the word thrilling. <laughs> I, can, I can hear them. <laughs> um, uh, it 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 does the same. Th we noticed this not as much actually in Mortal Kombat, um, but it does the let's fast cut through everything so we don't have to show how bad the actors are at actually fighting. <laughs> and so it just becomes a blur of motion and you, it's really hard to figure out what's actually going on at chunks of this. One of the things I will give it credit for though, is that as Zabin was a gladiatorial fighter, he needs to have like a lot of flash when he fights and it consistently keeps that th th trend throughout these episodes for that character. Yes. And I mean, I didn't look closely, but I got the impression that Zabe is one of the few actors that looked like he was probably doing his own fighting choreography. I don't know for certain, but I think so. Much how I think Bayou was doing most of his own fighting choreography. Right, right. So regardless of the Panther sounds, both, Bayou... Were. Sorry, go ahead. I was just saying, I don't think Conan and Otley were. I think there were stunt doubles for those. And um, for Bayou, one of the reasons I think we did like a little game about Fighter Rogue is that Bayou is the only character throughout all of this that consistently rotates which weapons they use. Oh, I so that's notice. why I made them a fighter because they're I'm proficient in all weapons. I actually didn't notice that. That's actually pretty cool. 
Conan, I am proficient in my big ass bastards, my big ass two handed sword. Um, right. Zabin, I'm proficient in my staff and these motherfucking fists. Otley, I got daggers and cutting words that make you bleed more than those. <laughs> right. Which is why he's definitely a bard. Uh, buy you anything I can get my hands on, I can use. Which is cool. Actually, I did, I did not notice that before, but that is actually very cool. We, they got they got away from the here's my signature weapon, which is very much a trope of the '90s. And I'm not gonna lie, who who the fuck uses a flail? Um, anything else <laughs> about this part before we move on? No, I think we can move on. All right, I can still hang out here and talk about. I won't do it. Um, our heroes ride on on looking for the looking for their friend, and they're ambushed again. This time, successfully knocked out by blow darts. Um, once awakened, the people. Uh, I should have watched this before Monday afternoon, so I could have talked to Eddie about it. Um, <laughs> in relation to the people, no, and they know Conan. His reputation has exceeded him over these past six episodes. They discover that much like C three PO, Otley has become their god, and the group tricks the people into believing they're all friends. Then Otley drops a big exposition dump about the rubies and the people. Uh, a lot of village shenanigans go on. Bayou tricks a kid. Otley has a moral dilemma, hunting parties, and sexy times. Eddie, what did you think of the people? Uh, so, yeah, I was like, oh, the stars are pretty good. Oh, and then we're right into every possible native horrible stereotype. <laughs> all yep. at once. Just check every box. Betrayed by 99% white people, too. I think there was one potential person of yep. color, maybe. Yep. It was and, hard to and, tell and, with the low grain quality of the YouTube videos I was watching. <laughs> right. Um, and it's just, they don't understand our ways. They're so primitive. They're so stupid. I, I, I can pretend to be their god. They don't realize I'm not their god. Um, the sh uh, a slight spoiler, the show tries to kind of walk that back near the end, but it's so badly done that it, it it doesn't help <laughs> you know what i'm gonna push back on that and give the show <laughs> its credit to say that it is done at the same quality as everything else is done in this series that is such a non anything i don't know what it is the, the fact that your entire body froze for two seconds is all they need to know and he couldn't I, even I, comment I'll, for that time. He was I'll like, I'll reiterate, you are holding the ending of this episode to the same quality of a show where the best actor is the guy who literally speaks no lines. I wanted to really <laughs> emphasize this point. <laughs> oh, it's um, so bad, but I like it so much because this is so much fun. <laughs> now, in, in I will say in the midst of, of this just car wreck of offensive stereotypes, um, I, I, I did like uh, um, Bayou and the kid, that dynamic uh, of yeah. teaching the kid magic tricks. Um, and it walked up to an interesting subversion because the kid's like, what's magic? I don't know what magic is. Um, and so the fact that the tribe was not immediately superstitious and like, oh, it's magic. We must kill it. Um, but rather just like that magic. Okay, that's weird. Interesting. Uh, I guess this bullshit you're doing with your hands is called magic, whatever. I, th I thought that was an interesting take on it. And um, it, it's a classic trope of like the thief uses hand tricks to charm a kid or a woman into doing something. Um, but it was still a genuinely warm moment. So like that was kind of nice. <sighs> Prestigitation is always incredible. Um, I saw that scene and I, 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 re I rewrote how I was going to describe that because I watched the whole episode, but it had mm. by you tricking a kid to come out into the woods was originally how it was phrased. Like, mm. well, and then right, right. the episode ends with a better intention than, where, than what this scene was giving me. I think you're giving no, it no, some totally. love from the end and not like rogue tricks, naive person to tell them where their goal is. is right. No, cer certainly is. there was a lot of, buying Manhattan with beads vibe initially when I first watched it, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, uh, but I mean, we did skip over another point, um, which I, I, because you mentioned throwing away the Ruby earlier. Um, and the fact that like, uh, the, it starts because a horse got a Ruby stuck in its hoof and like, they're just, Rubies are just lying around. And so this tribe not realizing their value actually 
is established before we get into it. Um, so like you can see glimpses of this tribe is not as naive as they're presented, but it's just so badly scripted and acted and edited that it, it's you have to really dig to look for it. <laughs> um, I also want to give kudos to Otley, that character willing to come out with like no shirt or anything and stand next yeah. to Conan and Zabin. I couldn't do that. I could have never like, yeah. Ooh, that that takes. Have... And honestly, yeah, I mean, like, honestly, uh, that this is pretty quickly where, you know, I, I really started to enjoy Otley as a character because, like, that actor clearly is, is game for anything. Um, and, again, him taking a shirt off is not a moment of fun. It's not made at his expense. Uh, uh, it, it, and it was so easily could have been. Um, but it, it's, it's positions like, no, he is just another warrior like everybody else here. And the world just accepts that as a fact. Um, obviously, as you mentioned, that wasn't always the case. But from my perspective, going into it from this thought, I was like, that's actually really cool that they're just like, no, you're just a badass warrior. All right. So and one of the things I would normally comment on that would irritate me is how, to some extent, the relationship between Otley and Bayou is, is combatively friendly. and But... Regardless of what I said about the acting, these two people make you feel like they're friends that give each other a bunch of shit. Like they're they're two male friends that are like, well, fuck you, man. Fuck you. Oh, I love you, man. And mm -hmm. they project that. And I want to give it some kudos for the acting that I felt. Yeah, I honestly thought, oh, they've done six episodes. They've settled in. But it sounds like they've had maybe an episode and a half to do this in. So that's actually really impressive that, that they got that chemistry so quickly. Yeah. Um, anything else about uh, Sexy Times? Moral dilemma, hunting parties. Moral, quote unquote moral. Maybe I shouldn't trick the tribe into thinking I'm a god, I guess. <laughs> oh, God. Well, all right. <laughs> I, I will take a step back to go. It comes from a, someone who the world has not treated kindly to be with people that consider you a god. That would be a hard choice. Sure, but this is, if the acting were better, that would have been an interesting dilemma. Yes. Um, but it really just does come across as like, hey, these people are stupid. They're giving me money. I guess I won't do that. Um, because you're right. The lines, the actual words imply, <laughs> why shouldn't I do this? Because it's time the world gave me something. But that's not yep. how it's presented. It's kind of presented as, uh, I guess I won't trick the backwards natives to give me all their shit. <laughs> True. All right. Anything else before we talk more about the acting? <clears throat> <laughs> Let's move on. While at the castle. Hazul banters with his skull that talks minion about why General Nor hasn't returned more rubies for the king to toss into the magic pool to feed the skull that talks that will then give him omens and predictions about Conan's destiny or aka the plot of this episode. Uh, with little other choices, Hazul transform his servant Luke into a dog to spy on Conan and she runs to wherever they are super fast like flash speeds and she sees Bayou tricking a kid into the woods for more rubies which she then tells Nor and the army moves out. Conan recounts his mission to his friends before learning that the army is coming and the trio ride out after Bayou and Dihan. The ruby searches uh, the ruby searchers bond over differences in their worlds uh, before reaching the magical ruby tree Magical ruby tree. Magical mm -hmm. fucking ruby, ruby tree. tree. Uh, Bayou and Daan flee while the army arrives. Bayou says he's going to hold off the army and he battles him shortly with his weapons. Then he battles him by being tortured before kids do what kids are going to do. All right, Eddie. What do you think? So um, I'm going to start by saying that when I watched this part of the episode, it reminded me there's an episode of the Transformers, the original cartoon, where they go, we need, a we need an energy source. We need a power source, um, the most powerful source in the world. And Soundwave goes, oh, you mean the ruby mines of Burma? And my next one goes, yes, absolutely. I'm referring to the ruby, <laughs> ruby mines of Burma. And I'm like, wait, okay. Every word in that sentence is wrong on just a deep level. Um Rubies don't do that. And so we get to Skull that Talks, which is, of course, the worst possible game master to think of a name at the last goddamn minute NBC I've ever heard. 
the talking skull. What is his name? I, I, I both skull that talks, I guess. Um, and it's like, okay, so we need rubies. Why? Because the skull that talks, whose name skull that talks, uh, needs rubies to give predictions. I guess it's like, okay, so I could just go to one of those, you know, glassed in viziers that cost me fifty cents and get like a little ticker tape prediction and that's cheaper than showing this guy rubies <laughs> to tell me oh yeah conan's gonna sword, has sword's gonna kill you well i knew that <laughs> but you wouldn't know what conan is doing week to week without feeding rubies to the skull that talks any and you're I king azul <laughs> and you want to keep ruling your lands so you know i mean there is a charitable part of me that wants to claim that uh skull that talks is a metaphor for streaming services <laughs> oh god but a that doesn't work timeline wise and b i don't want to be that charitable to the show <laughs> there's so much that happens though eddie come on we get bonding between bayou and dion we get a we get a, a woman transformed into a dog um oh this is my other point uh, um we're gonna see this trend in these 90s shows um, of magic written not because of the power level of the world or the impact of the world, but because what would be the cheapest special effect to achieve on television? So, like, <laughs> polymorph a person to a dog, super cheap. Just take woman out, put dog in, great. Teleportation, <laughs> super cheap to do. Just literally just walk away from the camera. Fireball, fuck that. No goddamn way you get a fireball. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna put it out here. If Hazul knows that Conan is coming, it seems to have an endless army. Why does he constantly send one general and like twenty soldiers every single week? Don't say so this show doesn't end. But if no, you were no. thinking like the evil wizard, why would I you have, send that? I have an answer for you because they are expensive, and he's throwing all his money into a fucking pot of the talking <laughs> skull, Chris. <laughs> But he's so powerful, Eddie. He turns the people of this into are dogs. All wrong. Why doesn't he turn Conan into a dog from the castle and be done with it? Why does it have to be rubies? Why can't, why can't, you know, why can't we use like you know quartz? Why can't just, why can't just skeleton quartz? <sighs> you know as well as I do that for certain magic rituals, they require very specific ingredients to operate. <laughs> I also love the fact that this plot point, this critical plot point that the skull that talks requires rubies is never mentioned again. <laughs> well, well, we can't spoil it yet, Eddie, the ending of why it does not brought back up. Is there anything else you want to say about this before we move on? Uh, Other than in Bayou standing up to an army, army of like 20 soldiers all by himself, only to have Dion run back in to give away everything. Uh, it, <laughs> I mean, there's the... Tr- Typical plot point of like the the thief is trying to trick people into getting rubies because it's rubies and they're free and I want to have money and it's just like I I get that what what what, what confuses me is that all of them are equally cash strapped. Uh, Conan literally throws a ruby away. He's that dismissive of money. Uh, vengeance, uh, vengeance and crom. That's all Conan needs, Eddie. Right, Oddly, and, and women decides that the problem is to just I, I need that to control the source rather than just acquiring the actual cash so these had the same issue with uh value just from a different structural standpoint and even just like I, i'm just i'm just here i'm just hanging out this is cool i, I guess rubies are nice um which makes it even again the, the most chill of all the characters it's like oh, whatever i'm just here to kill people it's cool you know, that just made me realize that Otley is living... It, Otley is this show's Paul Atreides. Okay. I'm on board with that. Comes to a people, becomes like their god, and they're willing to give him everything. I'm selling you. And so Otley makes is- better mold choices than Paul Atreides. There you go, all you Frank Herbert fans. This show is better <laughs> than Dude. That'll well, be the sound bite show. I'll hear forever. Oh, Lord. Just, just, just call the show Otley the Adventurer, frankly. <laughs> I was thinking like uh, uh, oddly the colonizer, but each of their own. Uh, anything else? Or move it on. I don't care. Move it on. Um, All right. Then another thrilling fight scene and a rescue. Then the people arrive and finish the battle. Otley comes clean, 
before leaving with Conan and his friends. Nor is allowed to live so that Zul won't go after the people as he drops him with a fat, fat wad of rubies that can feed the skull that talks for the rest of this series. And the general is repaid by Hazul with death! The only trope this ending does not actually fall into is having the people come over the hill and literally saying, here come the cavalry, because that would just be the worst possible thing to do in this and moment. coffee did not spurt from my nose eddie you're good <laughs> but you're not great uh oh. yeah this happens but all right what about the thrilling combat that you saw this time does it get better every time we see a thrilling combat <laughs> it, it, no <laughs> it's, it's 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 the exact same combat so some people have paint on their face now that's the only difference <laughs> but this is this series is labeled as action-packed, Eddie, and you're not enjoying the action that you're seeing. All right. Would 97 Eddie have enjoyed this action? Probably. I mean, yeah. yeah. If we're going back to when we were watching, I probably would have – well, let me rephrase that. I would have enjoyed the action. I probably would have been like, but the acting is terrible. I would have noted that probably after two episodes. <laughs> um, but, I mean, uh, uh, this has – we keep it to keep on back to it. Um, it has got the same problem as Mortal Kombat does, which is the there's it there feels like there needs to be a quota of certain things happening each episode, and so it's like here's where the fight gets inserted. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, I ended on the gag about uh Zul, Zul uh killing <laughs> the general because it was funny. The actual I think closing scene is more banter and a moment of friendship between Otley and Bayou that reinforces their friendship, which is important for the rest of this episode to watch. Yeah. It's, it's like, I had actually, I, I watched this episode like maybe less than a week ago, but I had forgotten the details of the plot until you start going over them again, because I didn't care about any of that stuff. I, I genuinely buy you and Otley are the two standouts for this episode for me. Cause you're right. They're, they're genuine chemistry. And, and from a structural standpoint, it was actually kind of interesting that, Yes, there was heavy hand demoralizing. That's the kind of show we're making here. But the two people who wanted to steal the rubies were coming at it from opposite ends. And so their friendship over their joint failure to manipulate these people, which sounds bad when they say it, but it's actually it was kind of interesting, right? It, it's the, yeah. the two most gray protagonists of it aren't like oh we have failed and so we're gonna plot to do this again no no it's like no we're, we're both wrong and we're both gonna rib each other for failing but we both recognize that we we're wrong but the conclusions we each came to are slightly different so mm -hmm. it's not just they're not they're not they're, these characters are not generic um hilariously the character who gets the least character development in this is the titular one because conan has zero movement as a character throughout this entire episode he is simply the guy that leads them into the fight, and everyone else is way more interested than Conan. Well, to some extent, it's much like the Doctor in some of the newer, well, some of the series, because the Doctor is your primary character, but they can't change too much the Doctor because they kind of keep the status quo, so everyone around the Doctor changes. That's that's so, that, that, that's, that's, that's fair. I suppose Sherlock is is, is a similar concern, yeah. but it is more noticeable here because the actor. At this point in their career, I don't know about now, doesn't have the ability to portray that consistently how most of the doctors do or how any of the Sherlock actors do, regardless of how you like the Sherlock actor. They can portray that and those emotions are bringing. No, you're, you're absolutely right. It, 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 if the character is static but at least entertained to watch, then you can forgive a lot of that. Conan, he's, I'll give the actor credit. He's clearly trying. And there are glimmers and moments of, of humor and levity and character, but they're so rare and so few. And he's frankly upstaged by his entire supporting cast. But on the other hand, if you just want to go for pure aesthetics, there is no one else they could have cast to have played Conan so closely after people associated uh, Conan with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Sure. No, absolutely. You, you needed someone with a German accent who looks like a bodybuilder because everyone wants to have cut rate. Arnold Schwarzenegger for the show. So no, I completely agree with you. So either way, regardless of how good this show might have been, he was doomed. But he got his own TV series, so at least he got paid. 
Yeah. I don't know how much the 90s TV made, but. This went two series? Two seasons? No, just 22 episodes. Each episode okay. feels like a season, but just 22 it episodes. It does. <laughs> okay, moving on. Um, I like Red Sonia, the character. I like the bikini clad version of Red Sonia. And I vaguely remember reading the Howard story that has the real Red Sonia. And the name is spelt slightly different. I think it's mm-hmm. spelled with a Y instead of a J in the original text. Mm-hmm. They changed it to a J here to keep it as an homage to the character. And I'm going to stop there because I'm only going to say that the actress they chose to play Red Sonia, I did not like her interpretation of the character. Um, we open on a cloaked kidnap. We opened on cloaked kidnappers traveling with their hostage in a covered wagon. And the wagon gets caught on a cliff edge. Conan lifts the wagon while the others try to secure it. Then from nowhere, an auburn-haired, bikini-clad warrior shouts to them, Stop that! At a distance. During the confusion, the kidnappers secret away the hostage, destroy the wagon with alchemist fire, and then ride into the woods. The woman arrives, calling the heroic quartet, fools red sonia tells our party their quest for this episode <laughs> the hartons have kidnapped a boy wizard from the keepers of truth Lutin, luti who knows the secrets of youth the harton king is old and wicked sonia drops some more hot sick burns on the party before going in the opposite direction that they suggested because they're fools back at camp Bayou doesn't want to go after her to help her because she doesn't like them, but obviously has interest. And the others decide they want to go and help her. Alchemist fire, question. Eddie. Alchemist fire. Here's Burn. My question. If this character were not Red Sonia, if she were just another female adventurer who stumbled in this party, I feel like Bayou is right. Because Bayou's like, listen, this woman just showed up insulted us, told us a bunch of nonsense, and left. We have zero stakes in this game. We have no reason to get involved with these people. We should just go. Yep. The only reason why he's wrong is because people who are fans of Conan probably know the name Red Sonia and want to follow her. Yep. The the one thing I do, <clears throat> I will point out about this, is that it's Otley and Zabin who really want to go help her. Conan is neutral. Bayou's antagonist until they say something about, I think, Hazul that makes Conan say, well, you know what? Helping her will help us get Hazul in the end. Right. And Hazul is the overarching enemy of this campaign. Right. I do like the fact that Zabin is the person who's actually the most obviously horn dog for Red Sonia. <laughs> so you have the mute character who's clearly talking about her physical appearance and we as the audience are not be- having information relayed to us. But through his facial expressions and acting, it's super clear what he's talking about, which is a great way to strike that balance of they're sexualizing her, but in a way that the audience is not necessarily privy to. I thought that was an interesting way of, of splitting that balance. Yes. Uh, all right. Since you brought up that, I will agree the Zabin actor is doing great. And it is and it's funny because it's the person that has no speaking lines. Best actor in the show. <laughs> so, all right. Up to this point. If you had to rank the main crew, our heroic party of four, what is their acting? Where they fall at? One to four. By at this point, in, in beginning of episode fourteen, yes, where are they at? Right here, episode, beginning of episode fourteen. Uh, that's actually hard. Conan's at the bottom. Um, <laughs> come on, Ed. He's had fourteen episodes. He's still at the bottom. Yes, that's not my fault. Um, <laughs> uh, so of just the four. Uh, as much as I want to put Zabin at the top, I, I, I think I'd put Otley slightly at the top. I think it has to be Otley, Zabin, uh, then Bayou, and then Conan. And, and frankly, it's a tight fight for first place. Only, only reason why that is because I know later on um, Bayou gets slightly better material, um, so yeah. he's not quite there yet. Right now, he's still just kind of scared thief. All right, so for me, my number one, is almost equal between Otley and Bayou because okay. Otley's doing killer work and Bayou is doing good work, but is able to like match Otley since they're paired off together. I would say Zabin would be my number one 
because he's doing great without speaking lines. But then I take into account that having to read this text and be able to act it is a harder challenge because it's bad. It's bad. It's really bad. Right. Um, so I, I, mean, I, I rank them one, two, and three, and four. But honestly, those three are so close together for different agree. reasons. Completely agree. And, and <laughs> my, my one of the reasons why I rank David so highly is that he's also, at this stage – Adding to the chemistry of they all these three are friends. Conan's also allegedly part of this friend group, but from a pure chemistry and screen standpoint, those three look like they're friends. And the fact that Zabel's managed to get that chemistry across without speaking a line is genuinely good. Um, the mm. way he how he stands next to the two of them, the way that he watches people, and that's something else like the way he watches people as they're talking reminds me a little bit of people with with hearing loss and how they have to carefully watch people when they're speaking i don't think he has hearing loss i think he's just mute um but that kind of intensity is very important and so for the actor to get that across and be like oh no we're all friends and, and again like because we're now at a stage where people are less repeating what zabin said so the audience knows it um there's more kind of oh they're just jokes that we're not privy to because they're now friends and they have inside jokes that, and zabin's part of that um so little things like that that really help um but but you're absolutely right like i'm watching this show for the three of them now at this stage yeah. <clears throat> oh it is in when i when i put conan at four compared they're they're essentially like 1.1 1. 1, 1. 1.2 and 1.3 Conan is solidly like an eight and there are people in the middle that just don't exist that are still better than he is. I'm sorry. Straight, he is straight up. Genuinely honest. Skull that talks is over Conan right now. <laughs> Regardless of how bad skull that talks is from the puppet, that actor is loving life. Whenever they oh, show up, you can tell that person <laughs> understood the brief. We need to be as over the top as possible. Like on it, this skull will be eating the scenery so much that it will have no more pot to live in. <laughs> I would say, though, that Conan is better than Hazul. Yes. Oh, God. He's terrible. And frankly, All right. Red Sonja is floating near the bottom, too. Oh, God. She's at the bottom. Oh. The, ugh. Um, okay. Alchemist Fire. Go back to my point. Move away from their acting. How did you like the use of Alchemist Fire, Eddie? And I keep saying Alchemist Fire because it was probably one of the best special effects we've seen. Uh, I guess someone found some budget after making the Skull with Talks puppet and said, oh, hey, maybe we can do a little bit of fire. Um, okay, not a fireball, though. It's just, it's just going to be, you know, a fire grenade. We didn't get that much budget. Right. And uh, uh, this leads to a slightly bigger problem with this era of sword and sorcery specifically, which is that the original stories, which I've not read all of them, but the ones I've read, likes to play with the line of what's magic and what's just science that we haven't discovered yet, right? And so Alchemist's Fire seems to kind of fall into that gray area. But then the rest of the show, we haven't gotten to yet, but like they're, they're straight up magicians, like, like not even subtly yeah. – they're, they're just magicians. So this seems, so in retrospect, this scene seems weird because it's like, you can do better shit. We will see you do better shit. But right now it's just basically called Molotov cocktails. I, I think I'm going to give, the, I'll try to give the show something. Part of it is like everything else, there's scales of magic and power. And this could be the highest scale that the Hartnets have, which is why they need to go and kidnap a real wizard to come and fix their problem. Um, like, I suppose that's fair. Because if the king, their king, is as powerful even as Hazul, he could probably fix his own aging issue. Or at least become, I will age no more. Well, I mean, the, the, again, like the, 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 some of this is just muddied by the way it's presented. Because like it, it seems like he was a wizard king. Yeah. Um, but you're right. If, if you go with the idea of he's a shit wizard king. Not a wizard of shit, but a terrible wizard. Um, well, no, no, it could be both. Shit Wizard is a whole new D and D magic class that we have to get into. Um, <laughs> Pooh Man. So no, they uh, cast Poop Ball. Yes, right. Um, All right, uh, I will get off the feces. <laughs> uh, um, so I mean, like, I, I guess I can see that, but the the the, the, the sh we functionally have three different wizards. Then this episode. And the fact that they're all doing different things is not at all clear. They all have generic, what we can afford, 90s uh, budget magic. 
Um, and so it's hard to tell if this is supposed to be low powered magic or if this is supposed to be, this is what we can afford. Okay. So then I will give you something else from the pilot did the pilot established. There is like real powerful magic magic and it's frequently by wizards because in the pilot episode, there was Azul in the second episode, there was another powerful wizard that Conan has to trick to get past like his magic wizard shield with the help of like an elephant God and all this other stuff. It was, it was so bad that that puppet, it was a puppet Eddie that they had for the elephant God. It was, Oh God, but it established that there's real magic. And we also get to see Hazul turn people into dogs, which is pretty right. powerful magic in comparison. Sure. Polymorph. Yeah, Polymorph. There's a good figure. I almost think that what it lacks is it lacks an offensive magic, but I think that goes back to what you're discussing is budget. Right. Cause Ever, otherwise, everybody would be like Emperor Palpatine just shooting lightning bolts out of their ass. And I suppose if we go that route, then if this is the most powerful offensive magic we've seen, then this is not – it's the – okay, maybe offensive magic is just not a thing in this world. Yeah. And it could be in other episodes we haven't watched, but I'm not going right. to go back to watch them to find out. God, no. God, no. <clears throat> How did you like and, the quest that Red Sonia tells him? It was – so obvious like <laughs> she's like hey i just met you i don't know who you are and i kind of don't like you so let me tell you the entire quest i'm gonna follow because this is what the game master needs you to do <laughs> all right i'm moving on the the hartnett's rest their horses and craig fake paths to try to trick the heroes bayou argues that they should turn and ah, sorry not bayou bara the alchemist argues that they should turn and fight the party but the leader is concerned about what happens if luta the boy wizard gets hurt they'll all be fucked uh luta and bara joke around with each other a little bit as she tries to torment him and then he fucks her over by saying you don't have to feed me but then what's your boss gonna do before we whoosh back to the heroes and we find finding red sonia then <sighs> they try to force their help onto her, but she tells them that Luta can speak to her through the sky and will lead her there. All right, Eddie, I'm pausing for one second. We don't have to go into it yet because this is where I'm going to stop. But the fact that this Red Sonia is practically useless frustrates me beyond belief, and they shouldn't have called her Red Sonia. Um, as Sonia rejects him again, a band of wild people charges him, wanting to buy Sonia, which leads to a thrilling sword fight. Banter from other wildlings about buying Otley before Sonya wins a duel. Sonya wins a duel with a random mook, barely. Um, then a massive thrilling battle ensues, which the five win, and Sonya officially introduces herself to the group. The woman from the wild people attaches herself to Otley because it's true love. Red Sonya gives us her backstory and how she works for the Keepers of Truth. And they all bond over their loss and new families. Womp womp. You seem to have died on the inside, Eddie. You look uh, like well, you died yeah, just I mean, a little bit. I, I just, I don't even know where to start with this. Like, honestly, you got a lot of the points. Like, Red Sonia is, she's supposed to be on par with Conan, right? Like, one of her yeah. shticks, admittedly from the Marvel comic, but one of her shticks is that um, she will not, marry a man until she can until they defeat her in combat and that's why she's unmarried that that tells you everything you know about sonia as a fighter she's gone all this time no one has defeated her um and it's obvious uh, you're taking a lot of this inspiration from like the conan movies and i think the red sonia movie that was out and the marvel comic series that have been running for three decades at this point right and this is what we um, get the other thing that that bugs me is um and granted it's tiny television so maybe they don't can't go that way but um my favorite Red Sonia is actually the uh, uh, Gail Simone run that Dynamite Comics did. Yeah. Um, uh, and there's a, a panel that actually I have screenshot because I love it so much. Um, is uh, she's in a bar and she's like, "Listen, I, I'm horny. I'm frustrated. I need to burn off some steam. I'm gonna go flirt with this guy." And the guy's like, "Yeah, you're not my type." And she's just like, "Wait a minute. I read Sonia. I'm everyone's type." Right. <laughs> That's the kind of arrogance and sex positive character that I like. Yes. Um, none of that is on the screen here. Not a no. single drop of it. She seems to hate everyone. 
which fair. I mean, you know, I'll, I'll give her like her being able to banter with with the other men is is the only thing that's vaguely recognizable. Uh, but she's you're right. She, she's being manipulated by a magic user, which she hates magic just as much as Conan, um, into following the obvious trap that she doesn't seem to see. Uh, she <sighs> basically asks for help and then rejects it as soon as it's offered to her, which is just dumb. <laughs> and then she barely manages to exist in a sword fight. And now I could give one of those things, but the fact that you removed her fighting ability, which then why is she here? Right. It could have been this like Lottie's sister that asked him for help or anybody else. Honestly, you can, you can write Red Sonia on this episode entirely. Just have the magic user contact Conan and give Conan the visions. And Red Sonia is now completely superfluous to the plot. Yes. 100%. So in... Uh, nah. So I, I'm still... I'm su- this is the most annoying episode. And I'm irritated it was one of the highest rating ones. But I understand why it was so highly rated. is because it had Red Sonia in it. And people go, ooh, Conan, yep. Red Sonia, good. Right. And kind of how for when we talked about Mortal Kombat with uh, Matthew, they went a Sub-Zero raid and fight. Good. And that episode wasn't that good either. Eddie. No. Um, and then the. Oh, look, the wild woman falls in love with Otley. Isn't that funny? Because she's in love with the little person. And she's like, oh, God, no, they did do it. I mean, Otley pulls it out. Right. No, that's bad. That's a bad phrase. Um, I. Oh. The, the actor manages to salvage that really terrible material um, because he is – he could have very easily read that like, you know, Ugh, get away from me, woman, you know. But instead he's like trying to be sympathetic while also clearly not wanting her attentions. But it's still such obviously the comedy thing of, oh, look, you know, the, the woman he doesn't want is really into him. And she's like, oh, God, I'm so sick of that subplot. And again for – at least specifically to have that. It's like it's it's the closest the show has come of the ones I've watched of like him being an, made an object of fun. So I'm I'm torn on that. I'm I'm halfway with you, but at the same time, I'm looking at this Conan show where we have um a bunch of sexism, primarily scantily clad women throwing themselves at the party. Right. Right. Up to this Detroit. point. And the episodes I watched, there was no one throwing themselves at Otley. So I, I understand where you're at, and I somewhat agree, but then at the same time, I'm like, we're in episode 14. It's about time someone tried to get with Otley. Right, but if it was the way it a happens, char- it's not great. Right, if, if it was a character that the rest of the show recognized as being attractive and worthy of Otley's attentions, <clears throat> I would be more sympathetic to it. It's pretty clear that the show was like, oh no, this is the character that nobody would want, and she's forcing herself on Otley. That's the part that bothers me. So like, Otley should be, Otley should be, you know, sleeping around and, and and getting as much love as he wants. I mean, I completely agree with you on that. She looks super cute. Although I, I once again say my my YouTube were grainy, but she was pretty cute if I if I'm right. The show has done a consistent job of having cute women up to that point that they want to be sexualized. Fair enough. Um, uh. Suffice to say, it, 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 it's, it's, it's handled badly no matter which direction you come at it, right? 100% agree. The <laughs> one thing I am going to say, that probably the reason I have softened to it is because at the end of the episode and Otley True. making that really work. And no, that's, agree. And, and that that's is, why and, I give it so much credit. <clears throat> and and, I, and I said, that's why I chalk a lot of it up to the actor and a little bit to the writing, but mostly it feels like the actor kind of helped pull that off to make it be a lot less skeezy than it was probably originally written to be. Yeah. Uh, anything else about this piece, Red Sonia's backstory, the utter uselessness of this character in this episode, which fucking frustrates me. No, let's move on. All right. Uh, the party investigates a tavern. I myself have investigated many tavern <laughs> in my day and I enjoy doing it. Um, I though, unlike them would discover a fucking trap when it's set. And they only learn because Luti, who doesn't need anybody to save his ass, uh, Shakes his head no and turns and goes, aha, it is a trap in the grog. Uh, a thrilling battle ensues and Otley's new love is killed. We get fire special effects as someone is knocked into the fireplace and they catch a blaze. After the battle, 
the lying attacker spills the beans as he is at, begs to be spared, but Otley says, fuck no, and, and kills him in revenge. Bayou speaks for the people. Bayou speaks for the people in the village. What kind of wizard would allow himself to be captured? Some villagers, I'm sorry. I keep saying Bayou, but their names are so close. Uh, yeah, Aru. Brea, Brea, the alchemist, speaks for the people in the evil king's village about what kind of shit wizard would allow himself to be captured. Some villagers want to capture the kidnapped wizard that was captured by the king's evil minions to grow their crops. Later that night, while in his cage, Ludi is confronted by the evil old wizard king and tells him he, he is, in fact, his prisoner. The king orders his men to bring the woman from the village that talk shit about him to be a sacrifice. Uh, and he will randomly kill one person a day until Luti makes him young. Makes him young. Uh, the five arrive at the village and learn the king plans for snagging random villager number seven. Not the first six. The first six are crap. You have to go for seventh one. Because I think we panned through about six villagers before we got to her and she said a line. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Um, but this is the other half of my earlier debate of like Otley killing him in revenge and the way the actor played that bit was actually really fantastic. Mm -hmm. Um, cause again, like the, 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 the dialogue wasn't necessarily there, it, but he was like, he looked genuinely upset. And, and, and at that stage he, he took what could have been a rough storyline basically turns into maybe I wasn't, I, I, I was, I was nice to her because i wanted to help her out and then you just killed this woman and so now i'm gonna take you out and like like oh man otley is is hard and i love it you know um but a lot of that i feel like is, is the actor putting that spin on that material i i do want to point out through most of these synopsis that you've heard me read whose name have you heard me say the least eddie uh by you no, no, I, I said by a couple times. Conan, how often have I referenced Conan in a well, plot true. point? It's like Zabin does this, Bayou does this. Primary, this is Otley's show. Otley and his friends is what this show has become. It really is. Otley is, is the actual leader of the of the, of the, the group, frankly. Uh, Otley's crew. Uh, uh, I don't have anything else to say about I'm going to move on unless you have something specific you want to say. I, because I don't. Don't. Ludi doesn't need anyone to, re to rescue him. Literally, there is no point for anyone else here, and we'll get that in a minute. Also, I'm 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 weirdly impressed at how you could take this extremely simple plotline and make it super convoluted until last hour. It's like, hey, we're Act Three of the show. Let's add a whole bunch of new wrinkles. It's like, what? There's, there's another wizard, and, and and they're there, and they're captured him. It's like you ran out. You had. 35 minutes of plot, and you had to add 10 minutes of script on. I guess <laughs> that's what it feels like. <laughs> Oh, all right. We get another thrilling battle. This one with humor. Uh, the woman is saved before even going to the castle. The five defeat the soldiers. They hide out before even more soldier arrives. Villager number seven explains to Conan how hard their life is. Red Sonia volunteers to be the sacrifice while the others sneak into the castle. Ludi tricks the evil old and wizard king by granting him his wish. Peasants are revolting. Conan reinforces this is his show once again by killing the bad guy because that's all he can do. Uh, our heroes win the day. The boy wizard makes magic with the crops. Sonya and Conan share a look that could be sexy time sometime in the future, maybe. And then Lottie and Sonya walk off into the distance. Our heroes no poorer, no richer, but more experienced, I guess. So let's start at the end real quick. Conan and Sonya share a look, and you can tell that because the camera's super zoomed in at them as they're looking, so you can really <laughs> notice. By the way, they're looking at each other, and it's just like, I, yes, okay, I get it. Calm down. Put the camera back. You're too close. Go away. Do you know what has <laughs> zoomed like face. that? Why? Because those two have zero – they have negative chemistry is what they yeah, have. God. Yeah. They made my house cold watching that scene. Otley and the wild woman had better chemistry. <laughs> But she's dead. <sighs> Not even gonna go there. Um, uh, but but yeah, I mean, the whole Red Sonia volunteers to be a sacrifice. I was thinking a castle thing. Like that is a a a concept straight out of a Red Sonia comic. 
I'm going to go in and pretend to be the helpless damsel so I can kick ass inside. Except for none of that actually happens. She's nope. genuinely just captured. <laughs> and we get her fighting like the bad, gen- bad general for this episode. And she can't beat him. Conan has to show up and save her. And they do that so that people realize, hey, this is Conan's show, isn't it? We keep talking about everybody else. Let's have Conan kill somebody. There you go. Right. Uh, um. Yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I'm definitely with you that that's the only way I know it's so in this episode is because it's her name on the title card. <laughs> that's the only way I know. Um, uh, but, I mean, there are moments where you can feel like this show is like, what if we did Xena but with Conan's name on it? And you can feel like that they're, they're trying to walk up to that, but outside of the three, Conan's three friends, the show's just, like nobody else in the show seems to get it. Those three actors know what show they're making. Nobody else seems to get it. I will 100% agree with you until we get to the next episode. Well, okay. The Skull of Talks also gets what show he's in. I forgot to mention him. Yes. <laughs> I was I was thinking about him. I was thinking about a a certain female actress who is a reoccurring character in the series because she was in like the second episode and she's gonna be the seventeenth. I think she's in one more. Okay. So well, yeah, she knows I, what I, she, I, she's in. I I am talking just up to this point. I agree with you that yeah. the next episode seems like they finally figured out where they're going way too late. Um, but at this point, it's 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 this 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 episode should have been way more fun. And frankly, oh, yeah. it would have been more fun if Fred Sonia had been A, cast better, and B, written better. But even without that, um, the, the, this premise is ludicrous, but it's played straight, and so you see just how dire the plot actually is. Like, if if, if the gag was Red Sonia tricks them into rescuing a wizard doesn't actually need rescuing, that's a genuinely funny episode. And you can yeah. do the action-adventure stuff while like going, we didn't even need to be here. And that would have been a good little sting. And then Red Sonja's like, well, maybe I just wanted you to come along. You know, There's a very easy way to fix this. But because nobody else seems to be getting this, what the show is trying to be, they're trying to play a serious action-adventure. And everyone just looks like an idiot except for a few select characters. All right. I'm moving on. I don't have anything else I want to say about that episode because I'm irritated. All right. Season 1, Episode 17, the last one recovering ever, uh, The Crystal Arrow. <laughs> Our party are on horseback, traveling, and complaining about the long journey. They stumble over a dead soldier of the dark forces of Carthon with an arrow in his chest. The camera pans over to an ancient archer who shows his hands pulling back an arrow to fire. And then they show him and shoots like Hawkeye while taunting the Dark Lord, who dodges the arrow? Maybe that was a dodge? Uh, Bayou notes how cowardly he is, um, the Dark Lord. But seeing, but seeing Conan charging at the Dark Lord across like a huge open fucking battlefield, uh, Carthen hurls bomb skulls like fucking exploding penguins, but <laughs> better. Thrilling battle Incorrect. Ensues. Incorrect. Are, are exploding skulls the best kind of skulls? They're better than exploding penguins. The archer, Ryu Paul, is killed, but passes out a relic, the crystal arrow. To Conan, who hates magic. The Sumerian accepts it so that Hazul's power won't grow. With his dying breath, Rakan Pol dispatches the party to the people beyond the misty gates. Otley knows those gates are sealed with a great magic and no living man has passed through them. Exploding penguins are great. Well, not Sam or Slander. <laughs> Oh, that joke is never going to get old for me. No, it's not. <laughs> Love exploding penguins. Um, I'm actually surprised you said pulling a Hawkeye because all of this framing scene felt very Arrow to me. Oh. Uh, to the point of like the, we're not actually going to show the actual archery happening. <laughs> we're just going to pull back and then cut to an Arrow sticking somebody. <laughs> well, I could be talking about the Hawkeye TV show. They didn't there show was, the yeah, arrow shooting. Some, they showed some actual archery in the Hawkeye TV show. Um, hey, 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 Eddie. Yeah. Who's Arrow? Who's Hawkeye? Bullshit. No. I, I, <laughs> we did an entire runs on this. You will not <laughs> trick me into this. I will send an exploding penguin to your house, my friends. Because <laughs> you know what's better about exploding penguins than exploding skulls? They can walk, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> 
I think it's more of a waddle than a walk, but each of their Better own. Than a skull can. <laughs> hey, I don't did you see that guy's one. arm? He could be a professional baseball player from how far those skulls went. <laughs> and Eddie, this is the most damage anyone in this series, other than the Rocks, have done to Conan. And, and I mean, joking aside, like exploding skulls is a genuinely th- that's a part of the show that's getting what's happening. It's like going, like you said. What would it be a skull? But what if it exploded? Like that's the kind of dumb shit you should be doing in a show like this, right? <laughs> and it also the some jokes aside, but it goes back to showing from what we've seen and what I've seen, uh, offensive magic is not a thing in this world. You right. need something that you charge, much like Gambit, to throw at someone to explode. Right. So it's an interesting concept, which on one level makes archers even more effective in this universe. Like archers are like the people, um, mm-hmm. and wizards are great for defense. So it's a nice contrast. It puts them in ends. I like it. Right. Um, I, I granted, this is because you're watching Chunks episodes, but it just seemed like Conan's hatred of magic does not come up until this moment. Even though I know it's a very common trope of the character that he hates magic. But the reason why he hates magic is not because he's inherently anti-magic. It's because magic, generally speaking, is bad in the Sumerian age. So you hate magic in the same way you hate COVID. Right. It's like it, yeah. it's just bad for people. Oh. Which one of the things is reinforced is that Conan likes things that Conan can feel and touch, which we'll hear in a minute, which is probably why he doesn't hate that fucking Atlantean magic sword that his ass has been using since episode two. That's why I was so surprised. You're like, oh, he has a magic sword. I'm like, he does. But OK. <laughs> yeah. And one of the things for, I think, in this series uh, I remember the series I picked up from the comics, but it's implied that Conan is from Atlantean heritage, which is why uh, he's so strong and things like that. I can't remember if it's here, if it's from a comic. It, Conan's all mixed up in my brain right well, now. Well, actually, you know, actually, I think it is a comic because they did a, a, a crawl crossover episode where he was in Conan's past and implied that Conan was descendant of crawl because they were just trying to. I think it's like the 25th issue, so it's like a big celebration thing. Um, you mean so I think it's where that came from. Call whatever, yeah, not crawl. No, crawl's the guy with the throwy star yeah. thing. Crawl no, is call. a space guy. Yes, whatever. <laughs> They're all the same. They're all the same, Chris. Oh, God. Uh, so I will say episode 17, like you, they kind of figured out what they were doing. It's like, hey, this is a pretty good idea. And the starts is one of the best starts we've seen to the series. Yes. Episode 17. Right. I also like that Otley's like, oh, yeah, these gates are sealed by magic. And no one questions it. There's no justification why he knows this. He knows this because the plot demands it. He made he made the role as a bard for <laughs> bardic knowledge. And we just go on with our lives. Anything else about uh, Raku Pole, the Crystal Arrow, the Misty Gates, the thrilling battle? This one's more thrilling than the other ones have been. It was. Um, also, crystal arrows are just aerodynamically terrible. I mean, they're just but right on the ground. it's magic! <laughs> anyway. Do, wait, so you're saying the black arrow that felled smog is aerodynamically positive? Look at that big black stone head. That thing should have sunk like a rock. It snapped bowstrings. Completely agree. I mean, I, I, I since someone requested that I do an entire run on Green Arrow, I've become super interested <laughs> in how arrows actually work. Like, boxing glove arrows are a terrible idea. Oh my god, that's awful. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um Trust Crom. The party moves on after the funeral pyre. The cauldron skull taunts Hazul as he updates him about the story so far. The evil king sends sends a spy. As our party enters a town with a carnival in progress, and Conan has some private time with a sorceress carney. Uh catches an old and the, he catches an old friend trying to steal the relic but instead gets an exposition dump from her uh the ladies fight over who can go with conan at the party camp we get some banter before they realize a crystal arrow has been stolen on the trail zotan the sexy carney has been following them before we get another thrilling battle they are saved by Corella, the outlaw bandit queen, who is her friend Merlo that tried to steal the arrow, and they thought she'd stolen it. Now they think it's Zotan who'd stolen it, and not her. She gives us more of the plot about the arrow, about her people, how she was once 
found and orphaned and she believes that she could be part of them but doesn't know any of the landanian archer the landorian archers but maybe maybe she's one maybe zoltan is maybe they could be related now the cauldron skull suddenly can't track the arrow anymore <laughs> i love how you call the sorceress sexy carney because <laughs> she works in a carnival she's doing <laughs> carny magic tricks and because she is uh, is, is it a wrong descriptor no it's not wrong it is it is it is hilariously accurate okay um so i was gonna give a, an acting shout out and i'm gonna give my shout out to oh, what was her name again uh carla carla carella the banded queen because she knows what show she's in she comes in funny and hot it stays that way from the entire time through she came in funny and hot in the first or second episode but has gotten better since into here. Why? Why couldn't she have been Rizonia? I don't know. She was a lot. She's a lot more energetic and game for whatever the show's trying to do. Yeah, because I mean, uh, she seems to to get the vibe better of the. You know, I, I think Conan's cool and all, but also I got my own shit going on. And yeah. her, her, yes, yeah, she also had an info dump like Red Sonia is, but like it's like, oh no, oh we're friends, Conan. So um, ah, you got me out of trouble. I guess I will tell you what's going on. It's a much more organic introduction of the plot points, and uh, and, and like even the, the 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 fighting over who can go with Conan, it, it from. Zotana's perspective, it's very clearly the, the I want to go with the hot guy because that's my role is to be the hot woman next to the hot guy. But Corella's vibe is always like, no, seriously, I want to actually do the quest and you're <laughs> useless. So I want to go do the quest. Why are you fighting over me? I just want to go do the quest. Um, so it's funny because they, she actually has chemistry with Conan and the chemistry is also like, but it's not just about that. I actually have other shit. I have another, I have a, I'm in a different series that just occasionally crosses over with yours. And yeah. probably in that universe is a much better series based on the little acting we've seen. Um, it's, I have my own shit going on. Why, why you just, why? And so I like, I like the fact that like there's women fighting over Conan, but like it's, it's one of the women don't really want to even be in the fight. It was, it was an interesting dynamic. <laughs> so since you mentioned it, this actor doesn't seem to have chemistry with with anyone except for her. And that chemistry, I think, is a lot of what she's projecting. Because right. I saw in the pilot episode, the, his his true love, they did not have chemistry. No, not at all. Uh, and other people, they have not had chemistry. So I don't know what it is about, maybe it's the acting, maybe it's not knowing what to do, but I don't know. It, it doesn't work. Yeah. It doesn't work for no. me how Christopher Plummer's acting with... Um, Rachel, I forget her name now, in the Sherlock series we watched from the 1990s didn't work either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and I Dr. think this is a case Palmer. of like, I think the reason why her chemistry works is because it's more than just infatuation with Conan. Like all the other examples you, you mentioned are like, oh, I'm in love with Conan, so Conan has to play off of that and it doesn't work. Where she's like, you're cool and all, but I have other shit to do. And so Conan being frustrated by that, he's able to pull off better. I think that's why that chemistry works is because it's not just a, a we should hook up. Um, and the antagonism that we had with Red Sonia, there's supposed to be chemistry there, but because it was written just to be purely antagonistic, which to be fair, that is canonically their relationship. Yeah. Um, but again, he doesn't have that depth either. Um, so she gets what show she's in. Also, the Cauldron Skull has caught up with what show he's in now. Um, I think the skull that talks always knew what show he was in. Well, fair, but like he went from uh, uh, exquisite sarcasm to now straight up calling out his master's bullshit, <laughs> which is bold considering this is the guy feeding you rubies because apparently that's what you fucking need to survive. <laughs> but he's just like now he's he's m moved up to you really do suck at your job. It's seventeen episodes you've got nowhere with this plan. What the hell are you doing, man? What you're saying is. The skull that talks has big skull energy now compared to little skull energy <laughs> yes. at the start. Yes, yes. Um, I'm like, buddy, if you keep pushing this, eventually you're going to be put in someone's hand and turn into an exploding skull. So you need to, you need to watch your step. Like, no, I'm, I'm going for this guy. I'm done. I'm, I'm over this bullshit. <laughs> I think it's realizing that Hazul needs big, big skull more than big skull needs Hazul because Hazul is going to keep feeding those rubies all day long to figure out what the plot is. No, like 
when I when I, when I saw because because he wasn't in the middle episode, which is frankly another reason why Red Tony episode there is terrible. Um, but from the first one I watched, I was like, okay, he's the funny, obsequious, sarcastic sidekick. I get it. Here, it's like, is the skull that talks actually running the show? <laughs> and I actually like that now because like. like Hazul is terrible. It's like maybe that's the point. Maybe the point is that the skull is actually running the whole thing behind the scenes, and Hazul is just kind of his his meat puppet that he's manipulating and doing his bidding. So that's actually what's going on. That's genuinely good. No, that'd be awesome. That'd be. But then that feels like it'd be closer to uh, Morcock and Elric with like their gods kind of using them right. them as agents. I don't know if they're. I don't know if the people that made this have read that deeply in anything. All right. Probably um. Not. Anything else about the the love triangle? The bandit queen and her army of archers, which I think is exceptional. Oh, well, it's actually, that's a good point. Um, go back to Corolla because I, I love talking about her. Um, I did not know she was a recurring character. I thought she was just this episode. And so I was genuinely like, I don't know. It felt like the episode was written to like, I wasn't sure which, which woman was supposed to be the actual, like, lead character for this episode. Yeah. Um, they were both fighting, and you're like, I have a mysterious past, and she's like, I'm a sorceress. And so because I didn't know one of them was a recurring character, I was like, oh, I actually don't know which one of them is going to win out of this conflict. And so that was a genuinely a, 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 a source of tension for me. Now knowing that Carl is a recurring character, that actually reduces my enjoyment of the episode because it's pretty obvious that if she's a recurring character, she's the one that's going to be the one who wins out of this conflict, and sorceress is just there to act as a foil. But me not knowing that... I actually was like, oh, I mean, I'm curious which one is going to manipulate, which one's going to betray Conan, because one's a thief and one's a sorceress. One of them is going to betray him. Which one is it? I actually didn't know until pretty close to the end. Okay. Um, so I say recurring. I know that she was in two episodes. I think I read she was maybe in four. But when she shows up, they even make a joke about it. She causes more trouble, causes a lot of trouble. So she was kind of like, if you remember the old Xena and Hercules show, how Atalicus would show up. And oh, okay. Talik is, is he really your friend? He's going to steal your shit. And if it gets real, really real and he has to help you, he may help you. But still, I wouldn't trust Talik. Okay. And that, then that case, then that, that I, I'm, I'm back to liking it again. Because, right, yeah, if, if I knew that that was a relationship, then yeah. I, which one? Of the, she may betray Conan to get the loot or she may betray Conan because she wants magic. Um, uh, so, yeah, no, that's actually that, – but that was one of the few times in this watching the show. I was like, oh, there's actually some interesting social dynamics happening here. And the actors are getting what they're needing to portray. They're like, regardless of how silly the sorceress is, she knew what she was there to do. Yeah. So I'm here I'm here to, to be sexy and try to seduce Conan and ultimately get it over my head. And she absolutely nails that. And uh, my other point is that this show is does not have the, the writing quality or acting chops as Xena would. So you don't get the same Lucy Lawless and Bruce Campbell sort of for it right so get, er. um all right uh where is that uh zeban catcher captures Woo-hoo. zoltana who admits to thinking conan killed right Ra- right paul her friend but knows better now she knows magic to get them through the misty gates the dark army hot on their trail uh tries to figure out the magic of the misty gate uh while the bandits hole off the army <sighs> fucking hate this the ending of this um otley tries to decipher the runes turning the stone conan opens a gate and they enter zotan and corella bond over the possibility of being sisters trickster and warrior before encountering the forest guardian and archer of langdor with a special headband that lets her see through the mist who bonds to the party while zotan betrays them she escapes to the gate with a crystal arrow. She has second thoughts, but is stabbed by Kirtan. With the arrow, Kirtan's forces enter the Misty Gate, and a thrilling battle ensues! With her dying breath, Zotan sends a crystal arrow to Corella, who then fires said arrow, using it to save Conan from Kirtan. Sisters bond for one last moment before she kicks the bucket. Then we end on a post-party banter, flirting, and... So, Zeban was awesome. <laughs> He's consistently been awesome throughout the entire thing. He, he, he is definitely the kind of uh, of support character, right? It's the He's just quietly getting shit done while everybody else is doing whatever the hell they're doing. 
And so everyone's like, we all have stuff going on. I'm going to Zima's like, cool, I'm just going to go capture the sorceress. I'll be right back. Here she is. She's <laughs> <laughs> like, go boy, man. You're my, you're my man. Um, but yeah, the whole Misty Gates bullshit. It's just like, I'm sorry for the yeah. ruins. I'm sorry for the ruins. Turns out I turned the big rock and shoved the arrow in it. Who could have predicted the arrow was the key to go in, even though we were told literally <laughs> that was the key to get in. <laughs> And there's a big slit in the rock. Gee, I wonder what goes in that slit when I have a long, thin object I could put in there. Nope, let's decipher the runes first. Yeah. Uh, I do like that, once again, it almost from the pilot episode, it talks about Otley knows a lot of stuff. So Otley is consistently the knowledgeable one in the entire party that goes all the way throughout, I'm assuming to the end of the series. So that's a nice, consistent touch to keep. Uh, yeah. Once again, Conan does strong stuff. That's That's all he does. Sure. And granted, that's, you know, Carrot Conan doesn't understand magic, doesn't understand smart stuff. So I'm like, you know, there's nothing inherently wrong with that structure. It's just they, we keep getting adventures where Conan's skill set is not the best skill set to use. Then you rewrite so, them. Right, exactly. It's the, If Conan is your lead character, write episodes that Conan is the star in, not Conan is the reluctant tag-along to the more interesting characters. <laughs> Or you rename your show like Hyborian Age. Right. Um, and then the uh, two women, Bonds, maybe they were sisters, sure, whatever. Um, she betrays them, but has second thoughts, and then she dies. And it's just like the way the last bit was rushed, it really kind of comes across that Zoltana was like, Oh, I betrayed them because that's what I was supposed to do. But I really feel bad about that. It's like if you really felt bad about that, maybe you shouldn't. I don't know. Have done the betrayal part. It, 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 yeah. it's, it's so fast that it feels like if she'd taken half a minute to think about it, she would never have betrayed them to begin with. And I, I will say the the one part about that I did like is that they drop a reference. I think of sp- of Hazul sending a spy, and that right. totally gets dropped. And if you're not paying attention, you might forget that didn't who's also a spy? Oh, it's her. She's a spy. Right. But which, which, you know, is, is fine. I mean, uh, again, I'm not my, my problem is that either it should have been played like she was a spy all along and her bonding was just bullshit to get further to be trusted. Yeah. And then she just straight up is, is actually betrays them or a little more reluctance to actually do the betrayal um but what happened was she went to betrayal wait i don't feel bad for betrayal wait i do feel bad for betrayal now i'm stabbed <laughs> now, now i'm dead but we're still sisters even though that was actually not proven it was just a guess just <laughs> making shit up there was no paternity test i'm i, I don't even know i don't even know you <laughs> so i liked all right um, let's just move to wrap up like I'm done talking yeah. about this show. Um, I like the concept of the show, if not the execution. And yes. it's so easy to see how this show could have been better in so many ways that I'm not even sure if it's worth breaking down other than saying they should have rewrote the scripts to make Conan a primary character of the Conan series. Yeah, this is um, the, I'm with you. Like I, I mean, we be, we've been comparing it to, Mortal Kombat. I'm like, why did I like Mortal Kombat more than I liked this show? And I think we, we keep going back to this, but I think it continues to be true, is that the show is not nearly as watchable. Right? Like, Mortal Kombat, everyone kind of got what show they were in. It's a bad show, and it's an exploitive show, and it has a lot of deep fundamental problems, but everyone got what show they were in. It's like, we're, we're doing a stupid martial arts fantasy show, and we're yeah. going to do martial arts stuff, and we're going to do fantasy stuff, and women are going to be half naked, and that's just a show we're fucking making. I was like, okay, well, we're doing that show. Conan felt like it was trying to be re- – I use respectful loosely – respectful of the original material, res- something that felt like it was an outgrowth of the movies that were popular while also trying to capture the Xena market. And it just kind of failed on all those fronts until near the end where it's like, oh, we can do that if we put a little more Xena in. Let's the supporting cast really take center stage and and show what they're excellent at, and then we can still have the high octane and high octane quote unquote uh, action <laughs> to kind of propel things along. But 
like you said, 17 episodes in, they're just finally figuring out the formula. No wonder it got canceled. It probably got canceled right around the Red Sonja episode, you know? Yeah. So my thoughts are really lying up yours, and I'm I'm frustrated because I see how it could have worked, and that's mm-hmm. just irritating. Um, the one thing I will say though is that we talked at the start about a lot of isms that are going to pop up potentially. Mm-hmm. This show, as bad as it is, and Bally's did some things, managed to balance those out fairly well, given it was ninety seven, because we yeah. get like. A lot of cheesecake, but every episode we've got a bunch of beefcake because Conan and Zebin are just running around in Speedos showing the muscles the whole time. So, like, that is a nice, consistent touch. And while we allude to a lot of sex, we don't really see a lot of sex. And one of the things, because I read a couple people's thoughts on the series, and they were complaining because Conan didn't kill anybody. And Conan kills a lot of motherfuckers in this show. You just don't see, like, the final kill kill. So it it straddles that 90s line that they had to adhere to and still has a lot of violence and death. Right. Um, I'm with you. Like, uh, this, sh- this show could have done worse, right? <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, and that's, that's very big game with great praise. But, you know, given the source material they're working from, the women generally have a lot more agency. And I think you pretty consistently have agency in the show. Yeah. We've seen. Um, they're not all just falling over Conan. They're in fact spreading their affections around the cast, um, which is nice. Um, the cast, the, the, the exclusively male cast are sex positive without coming across as creepy or exploitative, um, which is genuinely hard to do, especially in the nineties, which is a miracle in and of itself. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> I mean, just to kind of reiterate, but like, you know, to have a characters like Otley and Zabin who would have been marginalized to the point of non existence or turn or at best treated as comic relief to be seen as genuine badasses in their own right is really exciting to see. We don't see shows now don't get that right. And I have some minor complaints about stuff they did with Bayou, but Bayou, much like those two is a full character and becomes more of a badass as the show goes on and is a solid member of the team from the jump, regardless of some other issues. And we don't get that now for yeah. people of color. Right. Exactly. Um, I mean, I've been focusing on other ones, but like, you're right. Bayou is, is genuinely an interesting character. He has an arc. All of them actually have arcs on some level. Uh, Zeban actually probably is the one that's the weakest arc. Uh, but Zeban doesn't need one necessarily. He's just, you know, I'm just your friend. I'm here to help out. Um, and that's that's really cool. So, I mean, there's a lot to, to like about this show. And yet there are shows that we have been just terrible to and gone, but it's really watchable. And this is the opposite. This is like, I really want to like this show, but I can't watch it. Because of the acting, the editing, and... There, there isn't a spark. The other shows yeah. that we could talk about that are bad but super watchable is because they had that spark, and that spark isn't something you can quantify. You just feel it when you watch it. Yeah. This, this feels like it was a show that um, someone thought would make a certain amount of money, and so it is. is a show that feels like it's made by contractual obligation. Um, and that's yeah. unfortunate because I think some of the actors we're genuinely having a good time and, and finding something special in the show, but it wasn't the lead. It wasn't the people making it. It wasn't the people writing it. And that you need at least some of them people to be on board with you. So Eddie, what, what are we covering next after the, the epicness of Coney and the adventure 1997 live action show, not the Coney and the adventure of the 1992 through 95 or 97 animated series that ran. Uh, so we're going to move ahead a whole two years to another show that spun off of an 80s fantasy movie, uh, Beastmaster. <sighs> and this one, we're going to go. I, I've watched an episode of this, and I will say the acting does improve from Conan. I, I love to. Like I said, we got to start at the bottom and work our way up. Um, so we're going to watch uh, episode one, The Legend Continues, episode two, Obsession, and episode 17, Tears of the Sea. I want people to know that Eddie has already started watching them. I watched this literally a day and a half before we had to record. Mm-hmm. And Eddie's 
at least a week ahead of me. For, that's how much prep Eddie brings to the series. I want y'all well, to know the amount of endurance that he has to possibly watch this show that far on so he can didn't forget about it before we talk about it and yes. save himself from the pain of having to relive it. Right. I, I just memory hold it all. So it's just like, oh, God, I don't know what happened. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I guess we will see you next week when we uh, uh, nope. talk. To- we we, we got to do the thing, Eddie. If okay. people want to find you online. Oh, no, don't find me online. Yes. Nobody wants to talk to me. Nobody wants to talk to me. <laughs> Everyone wants to because you are the slash sir Eddie Webb. <laughs> um, now, if you want to do find my work, um, go to pugsteady.com. That's my website. That, that's where you find me on Blue Sky. Uh, if you want to chat with me, you can find me on the Darker Hue Discord, um, where right now Chris and I are probably celebrating the fact that we are done with our cyberpunk assignments and our first one well my first one your second one is actually out in the wild uh it's tales of the red hope reborn um so if you want to get both of our work you can do that in one concise package wow that's nice um all right let's take a minute to some podcast talk do you want to just include where to find us in the in the bits of the podcast itself so we don't have to do it at the end anymore no, 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 no. We, we, we should do it. It is a tradition now. It's just uh, uh, there are certainly days where it's, I, 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 I am not feeling my career is great. So that's more than anything else. Oh, <laughs> I disagree, but that's a, a conversation we can have offline. If you're looking right. for me, uh, come join my Patreon. That's, I'm going to drop some something supposedly this month. I'm finished Cyberpunk, Eddie said, and I'm trying to write a Haunted West adventure, but I keep podcasting with Eddie instead. So blame him if it doesn't what? happen. Uh, catch you later. Sure. Bye.